the day I called to you. You came and pulled me through. Now I do all I can do. I bow down. You are welcome to sing any time, whether there's something on the screen or you just feel moved. Here's a, a song written for Pentecost called Blow Spirit Wind. The spirit moves, it's like the wind, right? It's, you don't know whether it's coming or going or it is just I felt it for a minute there who oh, spin Move and stir every breathless heart. Burn, power of God. Burn on our lips. Kindle a fire on this great and glorious day. Calling on your holy name. Ever new, yet still the same. We worship you. Blow, Spirit wind blow through this world stir every breathless heart burn power of god burn on our lips kindle a fire may we be like jesus breathe your grace and peace through us ever speak your language of love to everyone Blow, spirit wind, blow through this world, stir every breathless heart. Burn, power of God, burn on our lips, kindle a fire. As you promise, now we see everything has come to be. You delivered, we are free. The spirit wind is rushing in. Blow, spirit wind. Blow through this world, stir every breathless heart. Burn, power of God, burn on our lips. Blow, spirit, wind. Blow, spirit, wind. Blow. Spirit wind. Blow, Spirit wind. How about
Before we begin again, I just want to uh, mention logs for our first term in the fall for the Center for Worship and Music Studies out at the table. I invite you to come by, pick one up, look one over. Training for church musicians of all stripes and all interests, certification vigil classes. I'd love to tell you all about it. Uh, everything from audio training to biblical and theological studies to repertoire and program administration. Please uh, come check it out. I bet you know somebody that one of our brochures to good use. Thank you. And back to uh, back to you. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the assembly. And we're going to start out the way we ended with a few announcements. If anyone has lost a set of keys, they have been found. And you can check at the Senate office, which is out right outside the um, worship space here. And if you've lost a set of keys, you can claim them at the Senate office space. Also, as was mentioned earlier, we are well on the way to eradicating malaria in Africa, and we still need a million dollars to do that. And so donations will be accepted for the malaria campaign. And those can be made out in the um, narthex also where the bike riders have their display and there's some helmets that are available to serve as offering plates for any donations that you'd like to make for the malaria effort. And then we also have another opportunity to give with, uh, as Bishop Dave mentioned, with the trailer for disaster relief to be used by Lutheran Social Service and Lutheran Disaster Relief. And those donations can be placed up here. There's an offering plate on the altar. And if you make a check, the check can be made out to the South Dakota Synod with LSS trailer in the memo line. And I believe that's the announcements. And so now I would ask that we would view a video about Cameroon. Thank you for showing that. I was supposed to be during uh, my presentation. I just forgot to have it run. Uh, that was uh, the filming was actually done by Jim Nas, who's our he's now retired uh, Cameroonian missionary. And uh, Jim and I are great friends, just a wonderful human being. Uh, so we appreciate his filming of all that. Uh, when you saw that the big open piece with the rafters up, that's the new size church. Uh, they standardized the church about 15 years ago. Uh, I think about the time that Jeff Sorensen went over. Is that sound right, Jeff? Pastor Jeff went over when he was working with Bishop Andrea, and we finally had asked for a standardization, and I think that happened when Jeff was there. Uh, and so for X number of years, they built one size church. So you, you knew how much material you needed and how to design it, so on and so forth. Well, in any number of places, the church is so big uh, that they needed a big print. And, and these are not deluxe churches by any stretch of the imagination. You saw at the beginning of the video, there's only there's two that look like that in the whole country. And they both happen to be in, in Goundary, uh, where uh, one's at the headquarters of the church. It's called the Millennial um, and it's built for about 2,000 people, and most of the time when I'm there, there's about 5,000 people uh, in there, which makes it a little warm because there's no air conditioning. 
and the services always last six hours and 15 minutes when I'm there. <clears throat> I guess they just think they have to get their work out of me, whatever. Um, but we've had some issue with that. They've had to up their game on the, the construction of the walls. Uh, one of our groups uh, from uh, uh, Mitchell and St. John's, uh, the wall collapsed. So we've asked them, construction material and the requirements for the walls, we just can't have that in the future, nor do they want that. Uh, let's continue to keep them in your prayers. Uh, I don't want to in any way to suggest that we should not continue to keep sending money over for roofs. Uh, it is just a huge blessing. And uh, when we were able to do 25 in about a year, 15 months, there were churches in that list that had been waiting for more than the 15 years for their roof to come. So we, we were able to almost catch up, uh, but truthfully, the church is at least another 50,000 people bigger. It is just unbelievable to see how the growth has happened uh, in that community of faith. All right. Well, now, if we could have Pastor Patrick Hahn, please come forward. Um, he is gonna lead us in our Bible study. And hear how much I've appreciated your leadership uh, and your work in the South Dakota Synod, and uh, especially in our military as serving as a chaplain. So, Pastor Hahn. From the Gospel of John, and you all know the story. John the Witness uh, came to point this Jesus guy, uh, and religious leaders from Jerusalem uh, sent observers out to Bethany where John was preaching and baptizing, and they asked him, well, who the heck are you? Who the heck are you? And John responds, not in a positive, who he isn't, rather than who they wanted him to be. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the Messiah, he says. Um, I'm just the one who's pointed the way. Oh, there's one who's coming. I can't even untie his shoes, not worthy. From the beginning of his preaching, John clearly proclaims uh, God's anointed is come, and it is time to get ready. Uh, it was a time uh, to repent. There was no time to wait. Uh, there was an excitement in the air. Hearts were turned, and people were baptized as a sign of their repentance. But some wanted more, and they became John's students or his disciples. Imagine what went through their minds when John saw Jesus, pointed him out, and said, hey, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A day later, John, two of his disciples, Andrew, and a disciple who we don't know his name, uh, were with him, their master, and Jesus, again, points out Jesus. There he is. There's this guy I'm talking about. And immediately, those two disciples of John, master, and they follow Jesus. The word follow in the Gospel of John is often used not just to talk about following someone behind or where that person's going, but rather it's a, it's a word for discipleship. So these two disciples of John are about to become disciples and followers of Jesus. Uh, the work of John the Witness is on the wane. He will soon fade away. And now Jesus stands front and center in the gospel. And finally, Jesus speaks. We're still in the first chapter. Finally, Jesus speaks. He turns around and he looks at Andrew and this other disciple, and he says, what are you guys looking for? What are you looking for? And isn't that the question that Jesus, what are you looking for? This morning, what was she said, our guest speaker said that, uh, talks about St. Augustine. 
where he said, you, God, have free our, our hearts are restless until they find rest, we find rest in thee. And how true that is for humankind. For we want to dwell with God. For it's only when we dwell with God that we find lasting peace, joy, and hope. Well, those two followers, new followers to Jesus, they ask, well, Jesus, where are you staying? But not really. But they really weren't. Where are you abiding? Or what's in it for us? What is it you can give to us, Jesus? We'd like to know. Where do I abide? Well, Jesus says, why don't you just come and see? Come and see. And then the disciples, those two guys, spent the rest of their day with Jesus. And the writer uses the words coming and seeing to describe faith. Later on in chapter 6, John writes that those who come to Jesus, who see Jesus, and who believe in Jesus will have eternal life. That afternoon with Jesus completely changed Andrew and the other disciple. Previously, they called him rabbi. But after spending time with Jesus, Andrew just had to find his brother Simon to share with him everything that happened that day. He had such great news to tell him. But he didn't share good news about the rabbi. More prepared, we have found the Messiah. And then he takes Simon to see Jesus. And now Simon believes that Jesus is the one Israel has been waiting for so long. And then Jesus says, hey, you're no longer, you're no longer Simon. You're going to be Peter. That's what we're going to call you from now on, Peter. Disciples of Jesus tell others that they can see God's love most clearly in the person of Jesus. That's what disciples do. They tell others about Jesus. The next day it happened again. Jesus found Philip and he tells him, follow me. And, and Philip does. And just like Andrew, Philip's life is completely changed. And just like Andrew, he's got to go tell someone. And so he hurries out and he finds Nathaniel, perhaps his best friend. We don't know. But he told him everything that happened to him. And he tells him, hey, now I'm a follower of Jesus. But Nathaniel responds with a wisecrack, probably something more negative than just a plain wisecrack. But he says, what the heck, what good could come out of Nazareth, this backwater country little town? But it doesn't phase Philip at all. He knows and as he did once he sees, he sees Jesus. So what does Philip say? He simply says the exact words that Jesus says, come and see. Come and see. Nathaniel goes, he responds, and he makes the confession. Jesus, you're the Son of God. You're the Son of God. Come and see. Isn't that how it works? Isn't that how it works? Jesus invites us to follow him, and we journey with him, not knowing where the road ultimately is going to go. But we follow him. We trust him. We trust that Jesus gives us an abundant life, a life of purpose, meaning, a life that we can share with others. A long time ago, when I was in the seminary, I always assumed uh, that I would be, you know, my first call would be a rural congregation or maybe an uh, associate in a suburban or urban setting. Well, I graduated from Christ Seminary Seminex in 1976, and there are a couple of outstanding, glorious institutions that serve in the state of South Dakota here. So, not Luther, Seminex, all right? Well, a couple of months after we graduated, my wife and I packed what little belongings could fit in, I think it was three or four 55-gallon barrel drums. We hopped on an airplane. It took us about five days of constant flying. And eventually, we landed on a bumpy, curvy, tiny little airstrip. 
in the central highlands of Papua New Guinea. It wasn't an urban, suburban, or rural parish at all. Um, Lay Mish picked us up and he was, he dealt in uh, economic development and he took us back to a small warehouse where he had to tidy up some of his business uh, before he went out to the, his, the mission station where he lived or we would spend our first week in the country. A hundred meters or so uh, next to this small warehouse, there was 150, 200 people. They were, they were making all kinds of racket. They were screaming, they were wailing, they were beating themselves up. They were mourning the death of a and I, after all, those, after all those years, I distinctly remember that night uh, uh, we were laying in bed, looking up at the ceiling, and I asked, man, in the world did we get ourselves into? What in the world did we get ourselves into? It was an amazing seven-year journey of uh, learning languages, preaching, uh, teaching uh, lay evangelists, probably 90% of them couldn't read or write, um, how to preach Christ crucified, Christ risen, baptizing, modeling faith to first and second generation Christians who lived in society, but now we're being thrown into the 21st century. Little story masters, his name was Muli, who lived in the station that I did, told me a story about his life Remember seeing the first airplane fly over the, the uh, Anga Valley where we live, um, and it was that was probably 1946, 47, 48, or something like that. He was probably about oh six or seven years old, and he thought it was a giant silver bird, first airplane he saw in his life, and his grandson. Uh, went to a med school in Australia, and he returned home to take care of his people. How's that for a generation gap? How's that for a generation gap? Uh, the Anga people were in the midst of transforming from kind of a subs for total subsistence economy to a partial economic or money economy. And with the advent of uh, having the ability to acquire stuff such as tin foods, like tin sardines and rice, and uh, clothes and milled timber and vehicles. Well, with that came along alcohol and a huge uptick in domestic violence. And along with money came power, and power encouraged revenge, and with revenge came vicious tribal fighting. And through it all, in their struggles, many continue to trust the words of grace and mercy and forgiveness in life. What are you looking for? Well, where do you buy? Come and see. Follow me. It's amazing where Jesus takes us and what he wants us to do in his name. 1983, Mal and I left, except this time we took three kids with us home. Little ones, rugrats. Uh, I went to Luther for a year, assuming that uh, when I finished that year, I would, uh, again, be a parish pastor someplace. It wasn't to the parish. Not even close. Not even close. Uh, when I was in Papua New Guinea, one of our lay missionaries told me a story in his life, uh, how in the service he met a chaplain who introduced him to Jesus, and his whole life changed. So another amazing journey began as a chaplain to women and men in the Navy and the Marine Corps all over the world. Deployed at sea many times, uh, was stationed overseas. This is, this is the really hard part now. In Japan and Italy and Scotland, you know, that's kind of nice. Um, flip side uh, of the, I was in, I was gone almost 11 years away from home. Uh, I experienced a war and how young people who were asked to do terrible things trusted in a crucified and risen Jesus 
who were forgiven and who were fed a nourishing holy meal. After almost 25 years in the Navy, uh, Jesus quietly asked again, what you looking for? Come and see. And so in the summer of 2008, I got a call from Kevin asking me if I'd be interested in uh, serving in South Dakota. I said, sure, that sounds cool. A couple of days later, I got a call from Bishop Dave. He asked questions, I don't know what he was doing. They had nothing, I couldn't quite figure out the connection to the questions he was asking. Then I realized the most important question to him was, do you shoot pheasants? Do you shoot pheasants? That, that's, that's, that's what he was interested in, I guess. Well, the good folks and the faithful folks of Hosmer and Bottle called me. And so we continue on that great journey. All of us have been asked and are still being asked by Jesus, what are you looking for? And we often respond, well, where do you live? Where do you abide? What can you do for me? And Jesus, all, and we always get the same answer from Jesus. Come and see. Come and see. Invites each of us to follow him to be his disciples. To tell others where love, joy, hope abound. And to join with Jesus in making this world. Wherever you are, whatever you do, whether you're a pastor, a farmer, a doctor, a lawyer, whether you work in Arlington or Sioux Falls or Frederick, it doesn't make any difference. We are called by Jesus to follow him and to join with him in making this place a grace-filled world. What are you looking for? Why don't you just come and follow me? May all your journeys be awesome and be blessed. And I, it's not up there, but that's the theme of our, of our week this week. Thanks be to God. If uh, Pastor Bob Hansen could please come forward. Pastor Hansen uh, is, I feel really loud. Am I really loud? No? Well, it is up here, I'm telling you. Um, is it 43 years? 44. He's in his 44th year of uh, ordained ministry in the church. Uh, we plucked him out of uh, Trinity Lutheran where he was doing the interim, um, which they were not happy about. Um, but um, we were able to have uh, Bob uh, hit the ground running, and it has been a delight to work with him. And uh, I'm going to have you uh, do your work now about the appeal. So if you would turn your attention to Pastor Bob Hansen. Thank you, Bishop Dave. I was totally caught off guard uh, sitting in the Opportunity Lutheran Church in Vermont, South Dakota, and the phone rang, and Bishop Dave said, we would like you to be the director of the Listen, God is Calling, Never Be the Same Appeal. I think my initial response was, really? <laughs> and I said, well, I'd have to take some time to think about that. As I listened to Jesus, the Jesus that speaks to me in the New Testament, I never heard Jesus once say, give me your money. But I do hear him say very clearly, give me your heart. And he said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be all. And so I had to ask myself, first and foremost, was my heart in this project? 
And so to help me discern that, I had to ask some questions of myself. And one is, do I love the church? The answer is yes. I felt called uh, to be an ordained pastor when I was eight years old. I could very easily have been one of those fatal agricultural farm accidents as an eight-year-old boy. I wasn't uh, expected to live, but I made it through. But in that process, I heard a clear call that you are called to serve. And I have tried to respond to that in the different ways that God has called me to serve. And as Bishop Dave said, I'm in my 44th year. I'm still chucking away. But I love the church. And in those 44, going on 44 years, I have learned how important rostered leadership is in the church. Pastoral leadership is vital for healthy congregational ministry. And I firmly believe if ministry it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. That's the front line. And so I said, yes, my heart's in it. Because this appeal is about generating the dollars to raise up the next generation of leaders. And so for the first time in 40 plus years, uh, I'm not, not on deck to lead worship and preach on a regular basis on weekends, so I've been able to sit in the pew. And my wife and I are blessed to be members of Peace Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls and associate members of Christ Lutheran Church in Hartford, South Dakota, because that's where we live. We moved there a couple of years ago. And so we attend two different services every week. And when I have the children's sermon, and I see those kids come up, that's who I feel that I'm working for. We need to provide the leadership for the church that they will be a part of. Part of this whole appeal, and you heard Bishop Dave's talk about that, this is about the future. And so to help you understand what this appeal is all about, we would like to take time to uh, show uh, the video about the appeal that will be available for every congregation as they are involved in this process. Listen, listen, God. I'm Senator Tim Johnson. And I'm Barb Johnson. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is at a crossroads, and South Dakota is leading the way to encourage the development of new pastors. South Dakota Lutherans are seizing their opportunity for outreach and mission. And we are proud to join the South Dakota Synod in this campaign. The South Dakota Synod consists of 212 congregations, both large and small, proclaiming the good news of Jesus to every hungering soul in this ever-changing state. But as our large community congregations continue to grow, many small and medium-sized communities have dwindled in numbers. We've got a lot of congregations out there that are without pastors. We have several retired pastors in our congregation. Every Sunday they are out filling pulpits somewhere. So all these small churches really struggle. How can we support a pastor? How can we pay salary, take care of the pension, health benefits? How can we provide housing? We're 200 people with 300 people. And we just can't do that. The South Dakota Synod came out to the human population by with all those who suffer and feeding all those whose bodies lack nourishment. People come in off the streets, first and foremost, hungry and they serve three meals a week, about 200 people, 52,000 people a year living in homeless shelters. People working to get back into the community. We get those people that nobody else. Vision for the South Dakota Senate is that all may be fed. So that's not just about food, that's also spiritually. As Lutherans, we commit ourselves to seek out and befriend our neighbors. And as the demographics of our state continue to change, the South Dakota Synod has continued to expand its ministry to accommodate other cultures, such as the Hispanic community of Pueblo de Dios in Sioux Falls. 
And I think for them to be in a new country, it must mean a lot that they can find other people who speak their language. And if you go back in history, many of our congregations of worship was in Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, German. And it's important for them to have the opportunity to get together with that cultural background. From our Liberian community of faith that worships at First Lutheran to Woyatan in North Rapid, we have ethnic specific ministries that will always need support from outside. By the grace of God, our synod has been blessed to be the leader of the ELCA for encouraging folks to enter the seminary. But our current generation of leaders are beginning to retire, leaving vacancies in many of our South Dakota Lutheran congregations. So how do you recruit, invite, and keep pastors to replace the folks that are retiring that have served very faithfully and very well? So I really am excited about the future. I think we're gonna be able to get the job done, but it's a significant work to invite the leaders that we need for tomorrow. The theme of this campaign is listen, God is calling, never be the same. And our, our goal is 2.5 million years, over a three to five year period. God is called to us. It doesn't matter if we're two or if we're 82 or somewhere in between. But what we know as Lutherans is that when we have been called, we are forever changed. And part of that change is how we help each other discern what we are going to do in the world. One of those calls may be to the office of, of ordained minister. For me, that happened when I was eight years old. I discerned my call by going to camp and learned what it meant to be a Christian leader. Fell in love with outdoor ministry, working with youth, working with kids. And I said, I have no idea what I want to do. I'm going to go where the Spirit calls me. I was not one of those people that knew right out of high school that I wanted to be a pastor. And we need to encourage persons to consider pastoral ministry as a vocation. I think it would be incredibly sad if some of these gifted individuals that are inspired to follow the ministry are not able to do that for financial reasons. When I went to seminary, I could work in the summer for three months and I could go back to school and pay my tuition. You can't do that anymore. There was a time when it was inexpensive, but there was times I've gone away. Seminary tuition was $200 a year. It's now over 15,000. It can be tough. We have six figures of debt that my wife and I have to worry about before we even start a family. So there's definitely some concern there for us. Listen, God is campaign. Shore up more resources to increase seminary scholarships and debt reduction so we can provide capable leaders for the South Dakota Lutheran churches of tomorrow. Throughout my South Dakota Senate provided greatly. And so that financial help is, is deeply important. It has allowed me to take classes a little more quickly. I take two classes instead of one at a time, which will get me through significantly faster. Knowing that the South Dakota Synod is supporting us, frees us to try new things, to preach the gospel without worrying about paychecks. It's definitely an encouragement for my wife and I to want to stay in the state and the Synod for a long while. It has a huge impact. They appreciate the gift that's come to them. They tend to stay longer in their calls, and it provides them a way of living in those communities that sometimes can't pay quite as much as a metro area, and to be able to stay here. The South Dakota Synod and the people that live here have gotten much more diverse culturally, age ranges. In, in so many ways, we're more diverse than we used to be. We need to embrace these other cultures and be a part of their lives, helping them in any way we can. At the end of Matthew, we hear this go out into the world and baptize all nations. And it isn't baptize the people who are behaving well, and it isn't baptize just the cute little children, it's all nations. How much more complete are we when we have people of other nationalities and other tongues, other backgrounds that can help add to that body and help us be so much more complete than we are? We need that support. We need your prayers. We need your advice and we need your economic support. There isn't a person that couldn't help with this campaign or contribute in some way. Some obviously are more capable than others. And those of us that are more capable should sacrifice and do more. But I think the real key here is equal sacrifice, not equal gifts. It's a matter of everybody doing what they can do with that. And our prayers will be answered. And, and we're looking for your support in every corner of South Dakota. 
your prayers and your offerings and your support to this campaign and to other pastors. It's a way of doing God's work with your hands and enabling them then to do God's work with their hands. If you're passionate about your life with Christ, if you're passionate about the ministry of the church, then money will follow. I think at the end of the day, what you hope is that the investments that we make will strengthen our synod, strengthen the church for service and kind to the citizens of our community, or to the kingdom of God. Just, uh, you were all uh, given a copy of the prospectus that we're using to uh, lay out uh, the plan for the appeal, and I'd just like to briefly uh, walk uh, that through that with you. If you look on pages one and two, you see the leadership of the appeal. Uh, Rob Oliver is uh, chairman, but we're especially pleased to have his honorary chairman of the appeal, Senator Tim and uh, Barb Johnson. And then uh, we, the first phase of the appeal is the leader's gifts. And it's always been my feeling that uh, leaders lead. And the leaders uh, that are a part of this part of the appeal are those that are involved in the appeal, uh, the Synod staff, Synod Council, Support the Ministries Committee, and the Candidacy Committee. And the person that is headed up that phase of the appeal is Carla Borkhart, our Synod Vice President. Then all the rostered leaders of the Senate are invited to participate and make a commitment to the appeal. And the two at the Senate level are Reverend Will Olson uh, from Piedmont and Reverend Ken Stilson from Watertown. Uh, all the persons that are calling on other rostered leaders, all those have been trained, the visits are being made. Uh, between the leaders and the rostered leaders, we probably have uh, received about 75% of the statements of intent. There's more yet to come. Uh, then we'll be moving into a congregational phase, and the synod leaders for that are the Reverend Jonathan Vihar of Scotland, the Reverend Stefan Sadness at Spearfish. And want to thank them for their work at the synod level. And what they have done is recruit uh, conference leaders, uh, that are working in all of these phases at the conference level. And uh, we are also just beginning uh, the work of the major gift phase, and that is um, anyone interested in giving a gift of $5,000 or more, and we have leaders across the state that are working on that and developing committees. And in this particular area of the state, uh, Peg and Ed Shelskog, and I'm not sure that's correct. I'm a Dane, so it's uh, easier to say Hanson, Johnson, Peterson, Sorensen, but, uh, uh, but, but uh, I'll be meeting with them after uh, uh, this presentation this afternoon and go through their training for that phase uh, in the Bear Butte Conference. And we're also doing that in other parts of the state. And as of today, we have 164 volunteers that are out working on this appeal. And if you're one of them, whether or not you're a synod leader, a conference leader, a council visitor that have uh, agreed to volunteer, if you would just... And it's my guess, uh, by the time that we get through with the different phases, we'll have over 200 persons actively involved uh, in this process, and I am so grateful for them. Again, in terms of the generation of dollars, we're just beginning that process. But as of today, we have received in cash gifts and commitments of 500, 587 or $80,110. I am grateful for that. I'm a little bit choked up because uh, Bishop Dave, in his presentation, he said, we received over $580,000. No, oh, no, 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 because it's only 575000 Then somebody come up and handed me some envelopes, and I just opened them up, and we're over 580000 What a bishop, huh? <laughs> but 
Of that $580,000, $336,300 has come from our rostered leaders. I want to point that out as if the rostered leaders in this Senate say that their heart is in it and they're willing to give that amount of money and more is yet to be coming in, when we get to the congregational phase, I hope every congregation in this Senate can say, our hearts in it. Our heart is in it. The best advice I was given as I began the work in this appeal came from Will Olson from Piedmont. He said, make sure that you tell everybody who works on this appeal to give everybody the opportunity to say yes. You don't have to twist arms. You don't have to try and pry things out of anybody. Just give them the opportunity to say yes. And I truly believe it, and this comes straight from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If your heart's in it, the money will follow. And together, we can get it done. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve you, the congregations of this Senate, in this position. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob, for your work and your willingness to serve in this capacity. It's uh, changed his life a little bit, a little bit more road time than he was doing before. And uh, just can't say enough about the work that you guys have done in putting the team together. And a special word of thanks to all those that have said yes uh, in working on the committees across the whole state. All right. If we could get a credentials report, if the Reverend uh, Jonathan Steiner could uh, please come forward. We're gonna need our team back up front, Carla and Susan. Our report for this session is that we have 121 clergy voting members 164 lay female voting members, 110 lay male voting members, for a total of 274 lay voting members. And the grand total of voting members is 395. Thank you very much, appreciate it. All right. I don't know that we need applause for that. One, I mean, one, just from, you know, a competition standpoint, there's way more women than men here, and they're supposed to, no. I checked the Constitution. There's supposed to be equal numbers of men and women here amongst the lay voting members. So, gentlemen, go home and recruit. All right. Uh, we have two different elections that need to take place. Uh, one will be for the consultation committee and one will be for Lutheran social service. Uh, I have been serving on, I think I'm now the longest serving Lutheran social service board member. I was elected initially in 2000 uh, when I was serving as parish pastor out in Pier, And about the time that I was supposed to go off the board, <laughs> I got elected bishop and well, here we are. So. I'm expecting a huge plaque when I get done. In any case, if we could have the chair of the nominating committee, uh, please come forward at this time. Heidi, thank you. Pastor Heidi Binstock. You're not the chair. Oh. I'm not the chair of the nominating committee. I just represent the um, Support to Ministries Committee which brings, brings forward two names for the consultation committee, which is a six year term. The first name is to fill the lay vacancy and that is David Jorgensen from Mitchell. And the second name is to fill uh, the clergy vacancy and that is the Reverend Justin Nagebauer from Summit. 
For your information, the consultation committee is one of two committees that we hope never need to be called together. Um, they do the initial work if there has been a charge or there is a possibility of charge of discipline uh, against a rostered leader. Uh, and so in the history of our synod, I believe the consultation committee has only been called together twice uh, in the 25 years. So are there any other lay nominations? Are there any other lay nominations? Okay, are there any other clergy nominations? Are there any other clergy nominations? Not seeing anybody moving. I would entertain a motion then to cast a unanimous ballot for these two individuals to serve on the consultation committee. Thank you. Somebody actually has to speak at that point. I just can't make it up, you know. Is there a second? All right, all those in favor of casting a unanimous ballot for those two individuals to serve on the consultation committee, please signify by saying aye. And opposed, same sign. It is carried, they are elected. And then two names to fill vacancies on the Lutheran Social Services Board of Directors. The first name is the Reverend Betsy Hoyam from the Crossroads Conference. The second name is Bobby Brown from the, from the Northern Plains Conference and this is a second term. Again, just for information, the LSS board is constituted in, in several different ways. One, they bring up their own internal folks that they can elect, uh, but then there are also people that come through this election process to serve on that board because it is one of our partnership ministries here in South Dakota. Are there any additional nominations uh, for service on the LSS board? Are there any other nominations for the LSS board? Seeing no one moving, uh, I would entertain a motion to cast a unanimous ballot for these two individuals. Is there a second? Thank you. All those in favor of electing these two people, would you signify by saying aye? Are elected, thank you much. At this time, in our rural ministry video, Hi, I'm Pastor Bill, Director of the South Dakota Synod. It's these rural communities that day after day, God is calling people to the gospel through the ministries of our congregations in the ELCA. These rural communities produce not only bumper crops of corn and beans, but also leaders for the future of our church. When we work together, it really is God's work, our hands. One of the things that I have loved about rural ministry in my 27 years as a pastor is the deep rootedness to the congregation, to the area, to the soil, to um, a sense of families, and yet always that sense that churches don't exist just to look back, but to look forward, that it's always about the new year and um, the new seasons as they develop with the crops and with the animals and with uh, the congregation. So I guess it's a continuity that is something that I think is beautiful and rich and very biblical. Zion American Lutheran Church uh, has been here since 1874. It was founded by German immigrants who moved here from Russia. And in a very powerful way, we've never lost that missionary side. There are members of this congregation that can still trace their family heritage back to those first settlers that braved coming out here in the Dakotas, not knowing what they would be getting into, uh, the landscape that they would that they'd be living in, the kind of environment that they would hope to, to raise families and, and build a legacy of faith and tradition. Rural ministry is get in the car and drive. Rural ministry is ministry in blue jeans. It's going out to where the people are and having coffee. It's gathering in Bible studies and circle meetings 
it's going to the basketball games at school, and it's gathering for worship, for baptisms, for marriages, and for funerals. We have those who have been here for generations. We also have lots of newcomers that that have joined, that have uh, moved back to the area, that have started families, that have taken jobs here that are otherwise disconnected from, from rural life. But we seek to be a people rooted in God's word and this community and in our world, seeking to always be missionaries to those who are around us. I rely on the Synod. They help provide us with the resources that we need to continue carrying on ministry and the, the education to keep me on top of technology and theology in the modern world. As growing up uh, in this area, wherever we were farming in the fields or even uh, milking the cows, I was able to always visualize or see the church. Uh, we sit on a hill, a beautiful landscape, a big bell that we always insist rings when church rings out that it's time to get to church. Our congregation covers around six communities. We've gotten smaller because of modernization and larger farms, but we still have a spirit and we still reach out. We have gatherings at homes after football games. And we've had up to 50 kids show up for a meal and a, we, we call them timeouts, a short Bible study. I think one of the strengths comes from the emphasis on Bible study. At any given point, Pastor Jonathan has four or five Bible studies going on. I have had the experience of living with this community of caring people. Caring people who have of specific needs. And our mission is to take scraps of nothing, pieces of fabric that are of no value, and turning it into something that provides warmth and shelter and comfort to the needy. But this congregation uh, looks beyond itself. Rural ministry is not looking inward, but always about that wonderful, mission and idea that we are here, that we are part of the whole effort to feed the world and to be a part of what's happening in God's world everywhere. And so I'm out and about doing the, the work that I'm called to do at this time and in this place. And I love it. I want you to know how much I appreciate our rural congregations and the lives of faith that have that have grown up right alongside the corn and the beans. I give thanks for the missionaries, the pastors, the church leaders that have come from those farms, who have been raised in the faith in those communities, who have been sent out into the world and sometimes back into South Dakota. I give thanks for the work that you do and for the mission and the faith that you share. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Pastor Bill Tesh, and it's my honor to serve uh, in your Synod staff as Director for Evangelical Mission. And I rise up here today in order to share some opportunities around congregation renewal, especially as it relates to our rural communities. Contrary to uh, recent news reports that you may have heard, the church in North America is not dying. Okay, it's it's getting smaller, sure. It's uh, getting more flexible and focused, more about following Jesus Christ. I believe the church is being pushed to the margins of society so that once again, we as the church can stand with people who live on the margins of society. You know, um, these same changes are happening in our rural communities, of course. We know that. My first call here in South Dakota was to St. Paul Lutheran and St. Peter Lutheran churches in Humboldt and Orland. Those folks taught me a, a ton about what it means to be the church together, as Bishop Eaton likes to say. You know, if someone were sick or if there was a death in the family or, or, or a setback, 
people showed up and they came with uh, casseroles, yeah, and, and jello often, and, uh, and with caring hands and caring hearts. I learned a lot from the folks. And sometimes at night when we'd, I'd drive home from the country parish, which is St. Peter, I'd pull over to the side of the, ro of the gravel road and step out and look up at the vast expanse of sky with the stars spread out against the, the night and like a dome stretching from horizon to horizon. It was quite a, a welcome sight and a welcome respite from the traffic jams of an I-94 in, in the Twin Cities where I went to seminary. These uh, rural communities, they, re they resonate in our hearts. They mean a lot to us. Most of our congregations are in rural communities. Not most of our people, but most of our congregations. But even where we have a great, the greatest population in our larger cities or towns and bigger congregations, many, if not most, of those people hail from these rural places. And so I want to share with you a few opportunities that we have coming in the coming months for congregations, small member congregations, rural, multi-point communities to renew their life together and to refocus their mission. The first one will be introduced by a colleague of mine, Pastor Larry Strangy, who is the Director for Evangelical Mission in Southwest Minnesota. We're engaged together in a, uh, in a partnership uh, region-wide to bring the Discovering Hope to uh, the congregations around our region. And we'll be at five locations here in South Dakota. I'll let him share that. We prepared a video. He's got the movie star good looks, so that's why we went with him. I'm delighted to be coming to you on behalf of our Region 3 ELCA Directors for Evangelical Mission to invite you to an exciting event that will be taking place in our region on Saturday, June 27th. The event is called Discovering Hope. Before I tell you about that event, let me tell you why I'm excited about bringing this message to you. Martin Luther turned often to Psalm 46. It begins in this way. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble, a very well-proved help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with their tumult, the God of Jacob is our strength. The Lord of hosts is with us. When I travel around, I find a lot of congregations today, especially smaller member congregations that have a lot of fear. This day, June 27th, will introduce you to a process of discovering hope. The Holy Spirit is working in many and vital ways in smaller member congregations. We want to offer you some ways that you can discover that hope through practices that will be taught by our teacher, Nancy Nyland. Let me tell you just a little bit about Nancy Nyland. Pastor Nancy Nyland was trained as an educator in elementary education before she went to Luther Seminary. After that, she served for 21 years in small town and rural settings before going to the ELCA's renewal team to share her gifts in a variety of ways. Nancy will be teaching at the Berry Auditorium in the Offutt School of Business at Concordia College her teaching method is described as fun, energetic, practical, down to earth. People leave her seminars recharged and full of hope. Those 21 years come out in words like, this is from the field and for the field. Because you see, Nancy was one of the people that is featured in the book, Discovering Hope, Building Vitality in Small Member Congregations. Out of that came these principles and practices that Nancy will teach in a fun way through this workshop. Prayer, letting go and letting God. Worship, building community and hope. Making disciples, learning to live Jesus' way. Evangelism, a way of life. Caring ministries, serving as Jesus served. Leadership, who's driving the tractor. Discovering the gift of place. Mission, possible. Discovering Hope for the Future. The Discovering Hope event will be presented in one of two ways. You can go to Concordia College 
and be with Nancy and the other people that will attend at Concordia College in the Berry Auditorium, or you can go to a virtual location that will be located someplace in your synod. Check your synod website to find out those locations. A trained person will be facilitating that conversation with others who come from your area. Bring a group of people. You'll have a great time together. We are excited to have you consider coming to this event. We hope that you'll put together a small team of people that will come. The registration cost is only $75 for a congregation of, that worships 75 or less, $100 for congregations that worship 76 or more in their average worship attendance. Please check with your synod website to find out about registration and other things that are particular to your synod. We believe that the Holy Spirit is indeed discovering hope in many places when we look around and find it. So please consider coming to this event on June 27, Saturday, 9.30 to 3 o'clock, either at Concordia College or in one of those virtual locations found in your synod. Thanks for listening. God's blessings to your ministry. So it's called Discovering Hope. Please check it out, sdsynod.org. There's a registration and a flyer and everything you need to. And you know that that price applies per congregation. You can bring as many people from your congregation to those events as you like. After Discovering Hope, on beginning on August 21st, there will be a, a series of four workshops that you can choose to register for that'll help you to go deeper. Uh, it's called Growing in Faith Together, or GIFT for short. And our whole renewal team has been working diligently over the last year and a half to, to craft these basic principles of congregational renewal for our setting here in South Dakota. Our renewal team members include uh, lay member Margie Negebauer, pastors Becky Piper, Tim Serson, Charlie Bunk, John Paulson, along with Suzanne Hansen and myself here on the Synod staff. Uh, been working on, on these events for you. So uh, check that out on the website as well, Discovering Hope. August 21st. And the last opportunity I wanna share with you today is a retreat for rostered leaders in rural or multi-point settings. It's scheduled for August 31st, August 31st through September 2nd, and it will be held at a, at a hunting lodge, of course, uh, near Kimball, South Dakota. And uh, I don't believe we'll be hunting on those particular days, however. So don't bring your shotguns, but uh, do bring yourselves to that retreat. Uh, it'll be a great opportunity for people who share a similar context and some of the simil similar challenges as well as sharing some similar gifts to come together and talk about ministry. Uh, so now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce someone who's been a wonderful and tenacious champion for hungry people and for hunger ministries of the ELCA for many, many, many no, you're not that old, but for many years, uh, her name is Pastor Erica Lehman, and she's coming up to uh, share the winners of the coveted Holy Cow Awards. Come on up, Pastor Erica, and you can give her a warm welcome. Well, I hope that at least some of you were curious about the cute little cows that are sitting up here on the other side of the computer monitor. Those are the Holy Cow Awards, and uh, every year I hope that they return because they are traveling trophies. So I was glad to see that they came back from Highmore and from um, St. Mark's in Sioux Falls. So uh, every year we look at the statistics, the amount of money that has come in from um, congregations to ELCA World Hunger, and um, decide a large congregation that has given significantly and a smaller congregation that has given a, a, a great amount per confirmed member. And uh, we try not to give it to the same congregation year after year, so it gets uh, spread out. We have about a third of the congregations in the Synod give generously to um, ELCA World Hunger. More than half don't give at all, and a few just give a few dollars. So we'd love to see those numbers increase. But I'm happy to say that today, 
um, we are awarding uh, the Holy Cow to the larger congregation with a large gift uh, to ELCA World Hunger to Trinity Lutheran Church in Mitchell, South Dakota. And uh, they, uh, they are closely aligned with us at uh, St. John, so we feel a proprietary sense of, yay, team. And then um, <laughs> we also have um, a, a small congregation that gave $28 per confirmed member, which is excellent, and that is Bellevue Lutheran Church um, in Roe Howard. So uh, those are the two churches receiving the awards. And members, members of the uh, Hunger Committee are handing out our flyer for Bread for the World because along with ELCA World Hunger, we also work together with Bread for the World and we're deeply concerned about potential cuts to child nutrition programs. Uh, we realize that there are starving people in the world outside our country. We fight for them too this year. This is a domestic hunger issue and truly many of the programs that people in this country, especially children, depend on, school lunches, uh, WIC programs, um, school breakfasts, and um, programs that help um, daycare centers provide food. A number of programs listed on the back, even um, food stamps, uh, SNAP, the SNAP program, are threatened. And uh, we would encourage you, if you um, feel so moved, to put together a letter with the instructions in here. Be sure there's a return address on your envelope and uh, we will collect them. Um, I, I don't know what these lovely troughs are here for. Can we have letters put in there? These things, these boats ask, or whatever they are. Ask Robin, I have no idea what they're for. They'll be filled, but they're empty now. <laughs> so you can put them in there today, or you can hand them to me or to one of the hunger people. Um, just please write them. You can mail them off yourself as well. So if I could get uh, somebody from, or all the folks from Trinity and from um, uh, Bellevue Lutheran up here, I would love to present these awards. Thank you very much. Appreciate your work. And hungry people all across this state and around the world appreciate your work as well. Uh, we are actually ahead of schedule. Now, don't anyone panic. And so I've been, we got a resource here, let's use them. And uh, so I've invited Jay to come down and we're gonna, he's gonna lead us in a song and you needed to stand up anyway. So please stand up and let's sing together. All right. I feel so used. <laughs> K 
Can you see that, everybody? I'm putting my glasses on. You should do the same. Desperate people are making their way to see Jesus. Wounded and broken, we come for we've nowhere to turn. Longing for freedom from demons and all our diseases. He's making us whole and freeing our souls, and we owe Him our lives. For the healing of the world, Jesus came, Jesus lived. For the healing of the world, Jesus died and rose again. In His sacrificial life, God was making all things right. Mercy flowing for the healing of the world. Surely He's borne all our griefs and collected our sorrows. Here in the shadow of death, He's no stranger to tears. Silent He goes like a lamb as our weakness He borrows. He's taking the cup and drinking it up. Then He pours out His life. For the healing of the world, Jesus came, Jesus lived. For the healing of the world, Jesus died and rose again. In His sacrificial life, God was making all things right. Mercy flowing for the healing of the world. Still in our world we see people continue to suffer. So many hungry and so many living in pain. Now we must go with God's healing and justice to offer. For this is the call, He asks for it all. Will you lay down your life? For the healing of the world, Jesus came, Jesus lived. For the healing of the world, Jesus died and rose again. In His sacrificial life, God was making all things right. Mercy flowing for the healing of the world. All right, you may be seated, and you just look like you needed to, you know, nobody got hurt, right? Good. Oh, and I had someone at the coffee break ask me why we had a stick up here. Don't you like that? I love that. Why is there a stick up there? Well, this was a gift uh, from St. James Lutheran Church in Belfouche, South Dakota, uh, as I've said before, in the church, we never call anything by its normal name, right? Because it's just against the rules. So we serve communion on a patent. It's a plate, people. And we serve Holy Communion with a chalice. It's just a cup, right? Well, this is a shepherd's staff. But we don't call it a shepherd's staff. We serve. All right, it means shepherd staff. <laughs> but it sounds cooler, doesn't it? So now this was given in my first year. I was out preaching. Uh, it was presented in, in true South Dakota fashion in a shotgun case. It breaks apart. Huh? Cool. And... The woods on the top are ebony, heartwood, 
and t tiger maple, and they all come from Cameroon, all of them. And so I asked the man, I, got to, I, I met the man who made this, this crow so few woods from Cameroon. Why did, did you go to Cameroon and get them? Why did you use three woods from Cameroon? And he said, because I, I had that in my wood shop. <laughs> so very practical. I, I like that. I appreciate practical. Uh, and it has been a great gift. Uh, and I normally just use it at this place and uh, started to use a little bit more on ordinations and whatnot. So uh, I thought it was very appropriate that it came from St. James. Belfouche is the sheep capital of North America. Did you know that? They know more about sheep than any other place I've been to. So great gift and thanks to the folks there. So now you know, now you know what? There's a stick up. <laughs> All right. If uh, uh, Reed Christen could come forward, uh, he is a voting member of the church council, and if you would greet him warmly. Well, good afternoon, and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. I was uh, enjoying the uh, friendship and thinking back earlier uh, this today in the plenary session and the friendship that I've enjoyed with Bishop Zelmer that really started in our uh, representation as crossroads, our conference representatives to the Synod Council in the early days of the ELCA. And so earlier in the plenary sessions today, as new members were elected to the Synod Council, I extend congratulations, I extend appreciation for your willingness to do that, and mostly I encourage you to embrace that experience and certainly to embrace the friendships that come with it. It's a joy to be here with my fellow members of Zion Lutheran from Gerritsen, but mostly it's an honor to be here as a representative not only of the South Dakota Synod, but the other synods of uh, Region 3 within the ELCA as a member of the Churchwide Council. We've got a unique opportunity at the current time with the South Dakota Synod and really having three voices as a part of the Churchwide Council. Uh, Bishop Zelmer serving as the Bishop Advisor from Region 3, a remarkable young woman, Kayla Korski from T, a college student at Augustana who serves as the female youth representative to the council, and then myself. We came on the, uh, the church council at rather an interesting time within the ELCA, just as within the Senate, the ELCA itself finding itself in the need to continue to reshape in reaction to changes within the, uh, the church-wide organization and uh, so many changes that have come along with that in terms of budget and of staffing and of organizational details. We came on at the time of the election of Bishop Eaton as the uh, presiding bishop of the ELCA, a new secretary, new legal advisor, new treasurer, and many of the new uh, division directors as well. We also came on to the church council at a time that the, the, was a shift from a, a biennial assembly to a triennial assembly model a necessitating the need a temporary increase in the numbers of council members to ensure that we maintain the minimum through that transition without a year uh, with an assembly. And so we had an extra large uh, council, which was an interesting experience. And with the many new faces that came with that, uh, there was certainly a need for us to, uh, to grow together and to learn to again, to embrace the friendships and the experiences that came with that. We uh, scheduled an extra church council retreat to, to help us uh, to do that. And uh, it was an interesting time for us to help to establish our priorities and, and the level of involvement that we wanted as a council in the future governance of the church, which is of course our responsibility to act on behalf of the church wide in between the assemblies. Uh, probably an interesting action on our part is that we uh, made more for ourselves. We typically meet uh, twice a year in November for three days, and we've increased that now to a meeting for four days at a time in Chicago uh, to allow us for more time to develop and explore some of the issues that are uh, facing us. Uh, we're currently now uh, moving back to a more typical council structure with 45 members, and uh, we'll uh, gradually lose a few more members until we approach the next. Uh, I could go into a rather lengthy report on the many things that uh, we do on behalf of the church. We receive a lot of reports 
everything from the, the bishop's uh, think tank and mission funding to, of course, the treasurer's report, the executive committee, uh, the legal reports, uh, everything that's facing the church uh, as an organization and as a corporation. And uh, certainly also looking at the details on a churchwide basis, much like you've just done here with approval of bylaw changes and boards of directors to uh, Portico and to a publishing house and to uh, the seminaries. But I think the most important uh, takeaway for my representation here today is not for me to necessarily bring a report on what the council or the churchwide council is doing for you, but rather for me to be here to listen and take away from you uh, your desires in your direction for our church. And so I encourage the opportunity to visit for coffee and to hear your input and share in our joint vision for the church ahead. So thanks for having me with you today. At this time, I would invite uh, Terry Andrus, who is a diaconal minister and, serve, and works with uh, Portis's. Uh, she is our Region 3 person. Uh, this is someone that I work with closely, particularly uh, as we've had occasion for people to go on to disability. And then it just as a, we've had some uh, health care costs and, and benefits and whatnot. And so very much appreciate uh, Terry being here with us. And I wanted to have her uh, have an opportunity to spend some time with you. Thank you, Bishop Zelmer. Crozer. Hmm. Found that interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, stick better. Yeah, I was thinking when you unscrewed it, it was going to be a pool cue. <laughs> well, it's always good to be with you and the members of your synod. Uh, thank you again for inviting me up here today. I just have a brief little story for you. So there's a little girl dressed in her Sunday best, and she's running as fast as she can to her Sunday school class, and she starts to pray to God, to Jesus, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. Please don't let me be late. And while she was running and praying, she tripped on a curb, fell, got dirty, tore her dress, but she got up, brushed it off, started running again, and she started praying again, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late, and please don't push me over again. And don't we all feel sometimes like we're being pushed into things, um, even things related to our own personal well-being? Um, we all know what we should be doing, but how do we begin? A person may have the best of intentions, but feel as though we lack the support of others. And it's too easy to get diverted from well-being when there's so many things around us that we're having to react to. So where is your community of well-being? Let's start with Portico. Portico, as a ministry of the ELCA, is responsible for delivering cost-effective benefits and resources that help leaders strengthen your financial, emotional, and physical well-being. But we know that Portico cannot strengthen leadership alone. ELCA organizations and congregations are called upon to provide for your leaders. Leaders are expected to take care of yourselves so that you are better to shape healthy congregations in changing or challenging times. Now these are big ideas made possible through real practical steps within every community, one leader at a time and one congregation at a time. So are you wondering where you fit into this community? Well, let's start with those of you who have the ECA coverage. We're part of the 84.5 cent in your synod that helps us April 30. If so, thank you in stewarding your benefits. For those of you who are not part of the ELCA primary health plan or aren't familiar with it, Portico partners with the Mayo Clinic to offer an annual individual health assessment tool so each ELCA primary health plan member can see what's going well and what might need some attention in their personal wellness journey. Each plan member who completes the assessment has $150 deposited in a personal wellness account to be used for health expenses. And if their spouse is also on the health plan, they can also earn the $150. In addition, if at least 65% of all eligible plan members did come April 30th, 
every congregation that sponsors an employee in the primary health plan receives a 2% discount on the health plan contributions for all of 2015. For the South Dakota Synod, this adds up to approximately $54,000 that all of you can, can keep in your congregation and use for ministry. Now, not only did the South Dakota Synod achieve the 65% before the April 30th deadline, but your Synod was number one in Region 3 with those taking the health assessment by April 30th with that 84.5%. Now, of course, your bishop isn't the least bit competitive. So the fact that you were number one in region three is really not that big of a deal. But one other fact that I do wanna to mention to all of you, for the first time, all the organizations and synods achieved that 65% for a total savings of $2.5 million over the entire ELCA. So now for the 15.5% of you that have not taken your health assessment, you have until September 30th to do so. Elected voting members, I ask you to ask your pastors and any other employees who are on the Portico Health Plan if they have taken their health assessment. Now please don't shame them. This is a way to support our leaders and have this dollar money in your pocket to use for health expenses. Also encourage them to take advantage of the opportunity to earn an additional $350 in wellness dollars and also for your spouse if they're on the plan. Because when our leaders are healthy, our churches are stronger. So I have a question. Can I have a show of hands for those of you that are elected voting members? Raise your hand if you're here as an elected voting member. 60% should be raising their hands. <laughs> Well, doesn't your church deserve a leader who's well-rested, confident, and resilient? The congregations of the South Dakota Synod are an incredible gift, and we've seen that in the videos and the, the information presented in this assembly. You're where people hear the word of God and experience the life-giving support of Christian community. When your leader is healthy, your church is stronger. So I encourage all of you to stop by my portico table during a break and pick up the list of five ways you can do your part in building healthy, resilient leaders, both those called to serve in a paid position by your congregations, as well as those who are members of your congregations. We also have information concerning the introduction of online medical care and the addition of social impact first investing as an enhancement to our ELCA social purpose retirement funds. I've had a lot of really rich conversations already today about how leaders can help each other in your congregations to build healthier congregations, and it's quite moving to hear your stories. The ELCA also recognizes that providing benefits can have a significant impact on your budget. We are hearing you. I have some information that will help you better understand the costs of the ELCA health benefits. One leader at a time, one congregation at a time, we each do our part to strengthen healthy, resilient leaders who shape healthy, resilient congregations. So if you wouldn't mind, could we take a moment to pray? Dear God, we thank you for your gifts of time and resources in our very bodies. Grant that we may wisely use all you have given us, caring generously for others and for ourselves, that all may enjoy the goodness of your creation through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. And the people say, Amen. Thank you and thank God for all you do and may God bless your ministry and your time here together. Thanks. At this time in the agenda, we have a Bible study from Pastor Karen Rupp. Uh, and where is Pastor Kieran at? Right there. And as she approaches, as she gets up here to the pulpit, uh, I would also uh, invite you to say thank you to... That's for you. 
<laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's been a wonderful experience in ministry at Pine Ridge. I've been blessed that you all extended the call through the Synod for me to be there. And it's a pleasure to be here this day. When I accepted the call to go to Pine Ridge, I think one of the questions I can remember sitting on the edge of the couch in Larry's apartment and said, given my age, I'm probably only gonna be there. And everybody moved forward to hear what I was gonna say. And I said, probably for another 10 or 15 years. And I really had the intention of being there probably until I died or until the people told me they didn't want me anymore. And then reality set in last year and I realized that it's not fair, uh, fair to the community to um, be there with them with less than the full energy that they need and they deserve. And I was feeling my energy waning and also coming to the realization that most of my life, I've put work first and I have a grandson graduating in June whom I hardly know. So I have a desire to reacquaint and reconnect with the family. And knowing that the ministry is gonna be carried on in very capable hands, I can do that with a good feeling. And I thank you all. And I'm welcome the privilege of being here and having the Reverend Dr. Robin Steinke here. I had the privilege of taking a couple of courses with her at Gettysburg. So that's a good experience for me also. Ethics, that was good. So thank you. Um, our message, our theme, listen. Listen, God is calling through the word, inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. It's a favorite song, one I sing often with our young people over at Pine Ridge. It brings so much meaning and it's kind of the story of many of our lives, but I know mine in particular. Next slide, please. The story is the story of a faith journey. And I can share with you my early experience with um, campus, min or not campus ministry, but camping ministry. <coughs> I had the privilege of attending a summer church camp, probably between my sixth and seventh year in school. So I was probably about 11 years old, 12 years old. And each morning they would send us out with our Bible first thing and tell us to find a passage and reflect on it, to meditate on it. And it would be in the early morning hours while the grass was still wet and the freshness in the air of the rain that had come down during the middle of the night for it was that season of the year. And each day that I was there, I opened up to this passage, Hebrews 11, one and two. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Now this is the NIV translation. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. I got the sense that this was the key of life. And yet I spent many years struggling. Next slide. That's just a picture of the camper sitting under the tree or in a private place reflecting on this passage. And next slide, please. Many, many years struggling to figure out how to get that kind of faith. And that passage in Hebrews, it goes on to list so many fav famous people of the Bible scripture who listened to God, to listen to God's call and obeyed and I couldn't help but wonder why Noah would build that ark. Why would Abraham pick up his whole family and move? And it goes on to say that many of them didn't see the fruition of the promises that had been made to them. I wanted that kind of faith and I just didn't know how to get it. And I struggled and sometimes we scoff at the televangelists but there was a time in my life that was 
you know, full of deep darkness and despair. And I'd be up in the wee hours of the morning, and sometimes that's what I'd be watching, reading the Bible, searching for answers. And I can remember watching Rod Parsley one night doing an altar call, and me crying from the depths of my soul, and having found this passage in Matthew, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And I can remember that night yet very clearly having the audacity to pray and to tell God, I am going to keep asking, seeking, and knocking until I have what those people have that I see on TV. I want that kind of faith, at least what I perceived to be the kind of faith that they were having. And I can tell you that it was within two days that my life did a 180, that I came to an understanding that God loves all of us, even me. And I was able to come to a point where I could accept myself as I was, knowing that God accepted me as me. And it took a lot of hard work and more time, but I continued. I continued to, I think from that point on, be totally submissive. And to do whatever it was that I thought God wanted me to do, and actually to follow the morning prayer and the evening prayer to Luther, into your hands I commend myself, body, soul, and all things, and to just let go, and to be healed, and to receive the forgiveness. Next slide. One of the passages that came to me then, as I struggled to determine, having the feeling that I wasn't capable of loving or of being loved and trying to discern what is love. And it came to me in my morning meditations, the passage from 1 John 4:19, we love because he first loved us. And it clicked, it helped me tremendously, but I had to define for myself further. that For me, love isn't just the warm fuzzy feeling as we know, but it's more of an action. For me, it was like attraction, acceptance, caring, sharing, commitment, and trust. And all of these things are encompassed in that four-letter word, love. And yes, it could be hard. It could be hard to get all of those com uh, components in, but to know that that's what I felt that God offered to me, helped me to be able to accept others just as they are, even myself, and to, yes, get that feeling that I could learn to care, share, be committed, and to trust. And that's when it clicked for me that faith isn't just belief, but it's conviction and trust. Next slide. This was one of my, it's not the picture of the actual place that I would go to, but back in my hometown, there's a dirt road that goes along the reservoir and it climbs gradually up to an elevation of about a mile. And there, there's a little pool of water and a waterfall that comes down when it's been rainy season and not a drought. And that would be one of my favorite places to go, a place where I would reflect and meditate. And one of those places where I was watching the water evaporate and sometimes the steam rise off of the pool in the early morning hours and during the sunrise or the sunset, that I got that sense of the total connectedness of all of creation, that sense of connectedness that the Lakota have always had. And the phrase that they end their prayers with and the sense they live with, mitakawe oyasi, we are all related, all creation is related. And I would reflect on that and think that perhaps the water that was evaporating could have possibly been inhaled by Jesus and expired in all of the air and the wind currents and the condensation and evaporation that somehow perhaps we all truly contain 
particles that once were in all others. Kind of a wild idea, but it was my idea. Next slide. So God speaks through word, through angels and messengers, into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I think each of us has people who have entered into our lives, sometimes suddenly, sometimes people have always been there. But we hear them in new ways, and they offer words of encouragement or assurance at just the right time when, you're need, when you need to hear them. And I felt that in my life also. I had lived in the same small town in New York, probably fifth generation. Nobody ever had the audacity to move away. But it was a winter against this year with many, many blizzards and a lot of snow to shovel. And I was working in health information management at the time and working in the hospital. And it was February. And at that point, when we shoveled, the snow was going on the roof. And then you'd have to push the snow off the roof to keep the roof from collapsing. And I got a phone call from a headhunter asking if I might consider doing a phone interview with a little hospital in Port St. Lucie, Florida. And I looked out the window at the snow coming down again, and I said, yes, I would. So I did the phone interview, and two months later, I was working in a little hospital in Port St. Lucie, Florida. That seems to be one of those trigger events. Um, I shared with you, I was, had been full of darkness and despair. But I was also a person who had been full of fears. And I had to do things by myself. But I prayed on this before I did it. And felt totally comfortable and without fear. And taking the plane ride to Florida, going through the interview process. While I was there, they said, find a house. You're going to call on Tuesday. And I did. And they extended the offer for the job. And I accepted and we were, of all things, as I said, I was the rebel, the first one in the family who had the audacity to move out of our hometown. But that was the trigger that started me, I think, on the path to bring me more strongly into that right relationship with God and into the ministry. It was while I was there, the satisfaction of work built and making my money from other people being pray and meditate Again, taking long walks in the morning. Um, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? To whom? And the answer I'd hear is feed my sheep. And strange enough, I'd get a call from the pastor saying, I'm hungry. Do you think you could bring me some food? And I was thinking, well, maybe I'm supposed to do a restaurant. Maybe I'm go supposed to go to seminary. I don't know. But I knew that I needed to complete a bachelor's degree first. And I spoke to the pastor about it. And somebody in the congregation heard our conversation and said, the school you might be of interest to you would be Palm Beach Atlantic. They have an open house on Thursday night. Would you like to go with me? So I did go with her. And by Monday, I was enrolled in taking courses that led to a bachelor's in ministry. Later on, found out she didn't have to go. She was already in the master's program. She went out of her way, one of those angels and messengers that started or helped me to continue on that path. The hospital I worked for found out I was taking the courses. They were a secular hospital, no chaplain, no chapel. But they started calling on me to do chaplain-like things that I didn't think I was quite ready for. Um, there was a gal up in the ICU, or up in the OR, actually. Her dad was in, undergoing a code, and their nursing supervisor said, Karen, can you go be with her? Can you pray with her? And I thought, gee, first, I'm just taking courses, not ready yet. But I prayed, I went up, I accompanied her, and I helped her to make a choice. And then the hospital sent me to this seminar on critical stress management. And I thought it was going to be on debriefing employees who were going postal. And there are 16 clergy in me. And it was more on debriefing people after they'd gone through major trauma like the Oklahoma tornadoes. This was pre-9-11. And I said, I think the hospital didn't understand, and I'm in the wrong place. And the clergy unanimously said, you're in the right place. You stay. Could I have next slide? So I stayed. And I got the training in the critical stress management. Um, and found myself one 
wondering what's next? What is next? God has a strange sense of humor. I had co-workers who said I ought to be a missionary. When I was in church and I'd do the readings, the pastor might say, when are you going to seminary? I'd say, yeah, right. At courses at Palm Beach that, that led to a bachelor's in ministry, I signed up for homiletics, but I told the professor, I'm never going to preach. I don't know why I'm taking your course, and he just smirked. But I graduated there, and then I worked for Relay for Life. And as we were walking the track about a year after I graduated, one of the mothers of one of my volunteers who had had brain cancer said, what are you going to do next? I said, I don't know. I'm looking for neon signs. I don't know what's next. Now, some of what I'm sharing with you and have shared with you already, you can see there were kind of a lot of neon signs there that I've had blinders on to. But she sought me out in the crowd the next day and handed me a booklet that said, God guides when you move in faith, not when you sit in doubt. And that was the um, trigger that caused me to call the candidacy committee and apply to Gettysburg Seminary and to Southern Seminary. Ended up going to Gettysburg and graduated from there in 2008. Yeah, seems not that long ago. But one of the passages that I had read, as I said, when I heard the feed my sheep, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And as I said, that was the answer I got when I meditated. So many mornings, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say to whom? Feed my sheep. Ended up getting me, eventually, instead of doing a hot dog stand, getting me into seminary. Next slide, please. Go. Go. Sometimes it can be difficult to change from a comfort zone and the norm, moving into territories that are not in one's comfort zone, going into new territory. And that's what I found myself doing, going. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. Um, next slide. While I was in seminary, the, between the first year and second year, I did my cross-cultural and did it in Mexico City. I had the pleasure there of meeting Jose Alcantara, who was one of the founders of an organization called Amextra. It was a transformational ministry. And based on Romans 12, 1 and 2, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I think it was this experience that was very, very important in helping me in the transition to the ministry at Pine Ridge, where we can use much of the theology, much of the rationale that Jose and his companion used in forming these transformational faith-based ministry down in Mexico, where the people have input in determining what the problems are, what the proper response to the issues can be, and then putting them into action in a joint fashion, knowing that we are changed even as the people are changed in the process, and that we become ever more Christ-like in that process. Next slide, please. 
That's a picture from the Amixtra organization. Next. And so I find comfort in Corinthians 3, 18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Next, please. And then, of course, couldn't have a Bible study without this one. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And that's what I arrived at with my understanding of faith. I couldn't find it because it wasn't for me to find. It was a gift there to be taken and accepted. Once I opened my heart to receive, that I asked, sought, and knocked, that God heard, God responded. And I was able to develop that conviction and that trust. And I'm so thankful for that. It took me a long time. For some people, they learn it a lot more quickly. But my dad always told me that if there's a difficult way of doing something, I will be the one to find it. Next. Listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Pastor Karen, and thank you for your service with the people of Pine Ridge and the South Dakota Synod. We uh, we're gonna, if you, if I, if I have your permission, we're gonna move something from this evening now to this afternoon, because we're not gonna get to eat till 5:30 anyway. So just get comfortable, because the food's not ready. You know, you could just go stand there and stare at them, which will not help. What's that? Exactly, it's, it, it's supposed to be at 5.30. But staring at people does not make them go faster. But if pa Pastor Bob Chell, who is gonna speak tonight and talk about the 25th anniversary of St. Dismas, if uh, Pastor Bob could come forward at this time. Pastor Bob is uh, one of the pastors. He serves uh, on the hill in Sioux Falls. Uh, he has, uh, that's half of his job, and the other half is to uh, uh, raise the funds to make uh, St. Dismas work, and if you would greet him as he comes to share. I won't need a hug when I'm done. I got a hug. <laughs> okay. Am I on here? Um. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for your support of St. Dismas uh, because the men uh, who work in prison, there's about 200 jobs for the 700 men on the hill where I serve, uh, make 25 cents an hour, which means we depend on you for our support. And about a third of our support comes from congregations and about two thirds from individual gifts. So the first thing I want to say is thank you for your financial support. Thank you for your prayers, and thank you especially uh, for your visits, for those of you who come to worship with us. That's uh, an important part of our congregation, and I think the key to the success of our congregation, both on the hill where I serve and in Springfield at Mike Durfee State Prison, where my colleague and friend Quinn Sanderson is a pastor. Uh, they also host visitors each week. Um, this morning in his sermon, uh, Bishop Zelmer, uh, talked about the woman of the well who did everything to make her life work. I misheard him at first. I thought he said she did everything to make her life worse. <laughs> but she did. <laughs> and I think all of us have done that sometimes. By some wacky internal logic, we did something we thought made sense at the time. And looking back, we think, that was really stupid. <laughs> well, none of us is defined by the stupidest thing we've ever done. 
None of us is defined by the worst thing we've ever done. None of us is defined by the most shameful thing we've ever done. But the men that Quinn and I serve are, they're defined by the worst thing they've ever done, 24 hours a day, six days a week. Six days a week. On that seventh day, they're defined by the worst thing they've ever done for 22 hours. <laughs> they're reminded by where they wake up behind prison bars. They're reminded by the clothes they put on that say inmate on the back and inmate down the leg. They're reminded by the rules that they follow, by the decisions they do not get to make. But for two hours, things change. At 6.15, they're rung out, their cell doors open, and they come up into the chapel. The chapel is one place where they're known by their Christian name, by their first name, not by their number and not by their last name. It's the only place where they're men first and inmates second. St. Paul said the church was in the world but not of the world. The chapel's in the prison, but it's not of the prison. When you go in to eat tonight, you'll see a, a brochure and a little magnet on your table inviting you and your congregation to celebrate our 25th anniversary with us. I hope you'll do that. Uh, there's a list of some ways to celebrate. Uh, we're hoping that you'll pray that some will answer our invitation to become disciples with Dismas and to, to support us uh, monthly uh, through online devotions. Part of my job is to ask for your support, and I want to do that without... Uh, apologizing or being manipulative. We need and appreciate and cherish your support. But in that brochure, there'll also be three quotes by three of the men uh, who worship at St. Dismas. One says, St. Dismas is my life. Marty said that. He's a lifer. And he said that because St. Dismas is his day off, his vacation, and his holiday. On Memorial Day, when you perhaps were picnicking, the men were locked in their cells all day because the shops are closed on holidays so the staff can have more time off. And the staffing is reduced so more of the staff can spend time with their families. Holidays aren't special times behind the walls. There's another quote in there from Paul. He's a lifer too. The quote his, he has is a little longer. I took it out of a thank you letter he wrote. Last January, Peace Lutheran uh, in Sioux Falls provided us money to do a meal for the men. And a meal is a big thing behind the walls. The food is not good. But we serve brats and burgers. We see brownies as big as my hand. I have big hands. <laughs> I was real popular after that meal. But we didn't. We invited men who'd worship with us seven of the last 12 weeks. Paul only worshiped six times. But while he was a longtime inmate, he was new to worshiping with us and had come faithfully for the last six weeks. So we invited him to the meal as well. He wrote a beautiful thank you letter. Those of you who received the St. Dismas newsletter read his thank you letter. I only changed one thing when I printed it in the newsletter. In the newsletter that you received, it said, I was too young to vote when I came to prison. What Paul's letter actually said was, I was 14 years old when I came to prison. And he wrote in his thank you about growing up in a family that wasn't affiliated with the church and how much it meant to him to come to St. Dismas and share that meal. Yesterday, I received a kite. That's what they call a note in prison from Paul saying, I'd like to be on the ballot for the council election next week. The third quote you'll read is from Christopher. Christopher has a 70 year sentence. When he's eligible for parole, he will have spent more of his life behind the walls than he did on the street. This week, two, uh, Pastor Catherine and an intern from First Lutheran came in and interviewed two of our inmates for a class they're doing on the second article of the creed. What Jesus Christ means to you. Christopher is one of the men that they interviewed. He talked about his life growing up where religion had been a part of his life, but it had been a dark part of his life. 
an evil part of his life. It had not enhanced his life, but diminished it. And he talked about his life on the street and how he, looking back, he sees that Jesus was pursuing him. And now he said that he'd come to prison. He said, I lost everything, but I gained everything. And he talks about the freedom in Christ that he enjoys and the delicious irony of the upside down kingdom where we're healed by his wounds, where we find life in his death. Christopher is free for the first time in his life behind the walls of the South Dakota State Penitentiary in Sioux Falls. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve these men. You can tell I love it. I appreciate it. I appreciate your support. The men appreciate your support and they really appreciated their bishop showing up to their congregation affirming that they too are an important part of the body of Christ. Thank you. If you have not taken the opportunity to uh, worship with the guys, either down at Springfield or on the hill, I highly recommend it. I have been doing that uh, since I served in Mitchell at Trinity Lutheran. Uh, shortly after uh, uh, they began that congregation, uh, pastor uh, invited us to come on over and we put together a crew and, and made the journey. And uh, truthfully, life has not been the same since then. So I do recommend uh, your participation. It does take some work. Uh, you have to fill out forms and there's some process and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's well worth the effort and worth the time uh, to spend an evening with them. Uh, we have a little, uh, we've got a couple of pastors that I'm going to invite forward. They're going to uh, give you a little uh, take on some work that uh, they've started. So Pastor Jeff and Pastor Greg uh, Johnson, if you'd like to come forward at this time. You can just hold your applause until they're done. They haven't done anything yet except walk up here. <laughs> Well, new ideas for ministry um, sometimes just catch you and surprise you. And I think that's kind of what's happening here. Things are happening fast for a few of us that gathered uh, at the invitation of Bill Tesh, Pastor Bill Tesh and Paul Sternholm calling together the Sioux Falls area strategy. Whoever wanted to come and pray over what new ministry needs were out there could do so. I have to commend them. They didn't have a canned agenda. It was to authentically pray over the ministry that we are a part of and what do we need to hear together and we didn't rush through the winter. And then you could gather at tables as you began to hear each other. And a few of us on the east side of Sioux Falls started realizing we were talking about the same thing and that's evangelism and how poorly it goes and how the old language, the old vocabulary isn't working. And we talk about growing our churches, and yet is that even the authentic thing to be done? Is that the point of being in ministry anymore? And so we were chewing on this, and between us, um, we started thinking about evangelism, trying to come up with the right phrase, and I threw at you, Bishop Dave, the phrase relational evangelism. Had you heard of it? He said, I don't know. I'll put it out on listserv. So out to all the other bishops, relational evangelism was talked about, and a number of bishops got back to you, but the bishop from the New England Synod got on the phone and said, you've got to get Pastor Mark Huber out to South Dakota. He's doing things that aren't supposed to be happening. And so he's coming, and we are having a relational evangelism workshop on the 29th of August at Beaver Valley, just rural Brandon at Scott Hacker from Brandon Lutheran and myself and Jeff Sorensen were the, the three at the table saying this is a common shared interest. And Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. As well as the Presbytery, South Dakota is going to be joining us and in inviting congregations and uh, Bill helped uh, enable that to happen. We're searching for a different way of inviting uh, folks in a different culture in a different time. I've been a 
mission developer. I've been a mission redeveloper, uh, trying to help grow the church with what we call unchurched people who really are not. And, um, and what we're learning is that the language we use, the vocabulary we use, the way that we go about it just is not effective, at least uh, anymore. In recent years at Messiah New Hope, we uh, sent out mailers for a whole year to everybody new to our zip code. Uh, do you know how many people came to worship in response to those mailers? Zero. Um, we canvassed our neighborhood twice. Uh, I went, and another time members of our congregation went and invited and uh, dropped off uh, leaflets to everybody in our neighborhood, inviting them to come to worship with us. Do you know how many came from all of those? One. Um, inviting people to come to the church in those ways it is not helpful. So what we want to think of is differently. How do we begin witnessing, bringing good news to people in a language not necessarily of church but of faith? People are hungry, hungry to talk about faith with one another, and not just within the walls of the church but at the soccer game and uh, where moms meet and at Starbucks and uh, where real people gather for real life. And so that's what this is about. A workshop to help us to think about how we witness to Jesus Christ the language of faith with each other in a different way. And you will see on the Wind Synod website invitations to that and information and encourage you to join us. And I think we titled it about two hours ago, Unbinding Faith Relational Evangelism Workshop. So Kevin Stilson's been nominated, whether he knows it or not, to help us get the word out. <laughs> Unbinding Faith Relational Evangelism Workshop, August 29th is a Saturday at Beaver Valley, just outside of Brandon. That was worthy of applause. You did good. That was, thanks, thanks. Uh, if Becky Piper could come up for some announcements about uh, our movement toward uh, uh, dinner this evening. Uh, I want to tell you how much I've appreciated working with you today with, uh, between worship and music, uh, our time together in plenary. Uh, you've been attentive and on time uh, and participatory. I appreciate that very much. Uh, this evening, we're going to have the meal, but you're going to have some announcements first, and then we're going to have a prayer. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, then the, the, we're not done. Uh, for the program tonight, we'll invite you back. We're going to recognize and appreciate and honor those who are doing anniversaries, those who are moving from uh, active call to uh, uh, retirement, and, uh, and then we've got some pretty significant anniversaries uh, for some folks that are here. And then we get to hear from uh, our, uh, our president uh, from Luther Seminary. We'll also be uh, uh, lifting up people who are new to the Synod who did not come from seminary but came from another call outside of South Dakota. So you're getting to meet them this evening as well. All right, Pastor Becky. Our evening meal, which will begin serving on time at 5.30, will include chicken bernays, green beans with onion and bacon, mashed potatoes, salad, and a roll. If you had signed up for a special dietary needs meal, you can go to the window of the kitchen to receive your meal. When we are dismissed from this location, we'll invite you to find a table and sit down and we will dismiss you by table. We'll have one door that'll be an entrance and one door that'll be an, uh, an exit so we can keep the flow of those getting their food and those um, going back into their tables, we can keep that as a smooth transition. And we will be there to guide you. So please, again, if you have a meal for special dietary needs, please go to the kitchen window. And again, when we're dismissed, please go find a table. And only if you know that you're supposed to be at the reserved table, go sit at the table that says reserved, because they will get to eat first. We'll be watching. <laughs> you
You're gonna hear this announcement later on tonight, but uh, just as a reminder, tomorrow morning begins at 6.45 with our mission prayer breakfast. Uh, we will hear from Pastor Dennis and some from other folks. Uh, the meal, we will feed you. Uh, you can come at, uh, it will be served out in the narthex and we'll gather then in the fellowship hall. Uh, and that will start at 6.45 a.m. And so for those of you who are from East River, it's just easy peasy, right? It's, that's 7.45 for us. Uh, at this time, before we go to table grace, uh, we're gonna pray for the other assemblies that are taking place right now at this time all over the United States. Uh, and you're gonna hear from our chaplain. We're gonna invite uh, Pastor Jeff to come forward uh, to pray for them. One of them, North Carolina Synod, uh, is in the process of electing a new bishop. Uh, their, uh, their bishop is retiring and uh, they are, uh, they've moved through three ballots. I've been trying to pay attention uh, to see if I see any names of people that I know. But uh, at this time, I'm gonna invite you into prayer along with our chaplain. Thank you. I've got a list of a, a bunch of synods here. I, I was looking at this list and it struck me that, uh, I don't know if this is true, Dave, but uh, I think all of our synods in the ELCA are they have geographical names, is that right? Almost all of them do. All of the ones on this list, there are 15 other uh, synods that are in assembly this very weekend that we are gathered here in other places in the United States. And uh, they all have names of places. You will probably know people in many of these places or maybe have been there or can imagine what these places are like. So, um, so we're not just reading a bunch of names as we list these synods and their bishops and we lift them up in prayer as they are lifting us up in prayer this in their assembly uh, think about the elca lutherans involved in ministry in these different places in our country as we pray together let us pray we pray for the nebraska synod and bishop brian moss the Upstate New York Synod and Bishop John Machholz, for the Pacifica Synod and Bishop Murray Fink, for the Delaware, Maryland Synod and for Bishop Wolfgang Hertzlane. We pray for the North Carolina Synod and Bishop Leonard Bullock, for the South Carolina Synod and for Bishop Herman Hughes, the Sierra Pacific Synod and Bishop Mark Holmrood. We pray for the Metropolitan Chicago Synod and for Bishop Wayne Miller and for the Southeastern Iowa Synod and Bishop Michael Burke, for the Western Iowa Synod and Bishop Roger Preuss, for the Greater Milwaukee Synod and Bishop Jeff Barrow, for the Metropolitan New York Synod and for their bishop, Robert Rimbo, the Northeastern Pennsylvania Synod and Bishop Samuel Zeiser, for the Northwest Synod of Wisconsin and Bishop Richard Hoime, and we pray for the South Central Synod of Wisconsin and for Bishop Mary Froyland. We lift these brothers and sisters gathered in assembly. We lift them up in prayer now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Two factoids. The largest geographic synod is Pacifica. Uh, once every seven years, it's in the central part of uh, California. Once every seven years, they travel the entire synod assembly out to Hawaii because that's their seventh conference. And so they save money up for every till it takes them seven years to save up and then they go to Hawaii. And as Murray would say, you know, we never have any trouble uh, getting voting people to go to that. There's actually a waiting list at churches where boy, would we like to go to that. We just made them bigger yet because a Missouri Synod church in Guam just changed to ELCA and has been added. <laughs> to the Pacific. 
they have tacked on another another 3,400 miles to get to Guam. <laughs> and you think you drove a long way. So I'm sorry. <laughs> The smallest synod, I believe, is Alaska. I think they have 32 congregations, but they would be the second largest geographic uh, synod in the church. Uh, Bishop uh, Shelley Wickstrom has, I've gotten to be great friends with her. I just think the world of her. Um, her travel budget is significantly bigger than her salary uh, because most of her synod she can only get to by a pretty large plane. You can't even take a small plane. You need to take a small jet or a turboprop to be able to get there. So just to get to move around is daunting. Uh, so at this time, do you all know Come Lord Jesus? Do, do I need to teach you that table prayer? Yes? You can fake it maybe. If, just kind of mumble along next to the person next to you. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we rise and uh, do our table grace? Uh, again, you've got some time uh, to uh, prepare yourself for the meal, and then we will invite you back uh, for our program and our celebrations this evening. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. Have some fun as you make your move into the fellowship hall.